The Seventh Commandment of the Large Catechism by Martin Luther, translated by F. Bente and W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thou shalt not steal. After your person and spouse, temporal property comes next. That also God wishes to have protected, and he has commanded that no one shall subtract from or curtail his neighbor's possessions. For to steal is nothing else than to get possession of another's property wrongfully, which briefly comprehends all kinds of advantage in all sorts of trade to the disadvantage of our neighbor. Now, this is indeed quite a widespread and common vice, but so little regarded and observed that it exceeds all measure, so that if all who are thieves, and yet do not wish to be called such, were to be hanged on gallows, the world would soon be devastated, and there would be a lack both of executioners and gallows. For, as we have said, to steal is to signify not only to empty our neighbor's coffer and pockets, but to be grasping in the market, in all stores, booths, wine and beer cellars, workshops, and, in short, wherever there is trading, or taking and giving of money for merchandise or labor. As, for instance, to explain this somewhat grossly for the common people, that it may be seen how godly we are, when a man-servant or maid-servant does not serve faithfully in the house, and does damage, or allows it to be done when it could be prevented, or otherwise ruins and neglects the goods entrusted to him from indolence, idleness, or malice, to the spite and vexation of master and mistress, and in whatever way this can be done purposely, for I do not speak of what happens from oversight and against one's will. You can in a year abscond thirty, forty florins, which, if another had taken secretly or carried away, he would be hanged with the rope. But here you, while conscious of such a great theft, may even bid defiance and become insolent, and no one dare call you a thief. The same I say also of mechanics, workmen, and day laborers, who all follow their wanton notions, and never know enough ways to overcharge people, while they are lazy and unfaithful in their work. All these are far worse than sneak thieves, against whom we can guard with locks and bolts, or who, if apprehended, are treated in such a manner that they will not do the same again. But against these no one can guard, no one dare even look awry at them, or accuse them of theft, so that one would ten times rather lose from his purse. For here are my neighbors, good friends, my own servants, from whom I expect good, every faithful and diligent service, who defraud me first of all. Furthermore, in the market and in common trade likewise, this practice is in full swing and force to the greatest extent, where one openly defrauds another with bad merchandise, false measures, weights and coins, and by nimbleness and queer finances, or dexterous tricks, takes advantage of him. Likewise, when one overcharges a person in a trade, and wantonly drives a hard bargain, skins and distresses him. And who can recount or think of all these things? To sum up, this is the commonest craft and the largest guild on earth. And if we regard the world throughout all conditions of life, it is nothing else than a vast, wide stall full of great thieves. Therefore they are also called swivel-chair robbers, land and highway robbers, not pick-locks and sneak thieves, who snatch away the ready cash, but who sit on the chair at home and are styled great noblemen and honorable, pious citizens, and yet rob and steal under a good pretext. Yes, here we might be silent about the trifling individual thieves if we were to attack the great, powerful arch-thieves with whom lords and princes keep company, who daily plunder not only a city or two, but all Germany. Yea, where should we place the head and supreme protector of all thieves, the holy chair at Rome with all its retinue, which has grabbed by theft the wealth of all the world and holds it to this day? This is, in short, the course of the world. Whoever can steal and rob openly goes free and secure, unmolested by any one, and even demands that he be honored. Meanwhile, the little sneak thieves, who have once trespassed, must bear the shame and punishment, to render the former godly and honorable. But let them know that in the sight of God they are the greatest thieves, and that he will punish them as they are worthy and deserve.
Now, since this commandment is so far-reaching and comprehensive, as just indicated, it is necessary to urge it well and to explain it to the common people, not to let them go on in their wantonness and security, but always to place before their eyes the wrath of God and inculcate the same. For we have to preach this not to Christians, but chiefly to knaves and scoundrels, to whom it would be more fitting for judges, jailers, or Master Hans, the executioner, to preach. Therefore let every one know that it is his duty, at the risk of God's displeasure, not only to do no injury to his neighbor, nor to deprive him of gain, nor to perpetrate any act of unfaithfulness or malice in any bargain or trade, but faithfully to preserve his property for him, to secure and promote his advantage, especially when one accepts money, wages, and one's livelihood for such service. He now who wantonly despises this may indeed pass along and escape the hangman, but he shall not escape the wrath and punishment of God, and when he has long practiced his defiance and arrogance, he shall yet remain a tramp and beggar, and in addition have all plagues and misfortune. Now you are going your way, wherever your heart's pleasure calls you, while you ought to preserve the property of your master and mistress, for which service you fill your crop and maw, take your wages like a thief, have people treat you as a nobleman. For there are many that are even insolent toward their masters and mistresses, and are unwilling to do them a favor or service by which to protect them from loss. But reflect what you will gain when, having come into your own property and being set up in your home, to which God will help with all misfortunes, it, your perfidy, will bob up again and come home to you, and you will find that where you have cheated or done injury to the value of one might, you will have to pay thirty again. Such shall be the lot also of mechanics and day laborers, of whom we are now obliged to hear and suffer such intolerable maliciousness, as though they were noblemen in another's possessions, and every one were obliged to give them what they demand. Just let them continue practicing their exactions as long as they can, but God will not forget his commandment, and will reward them according as they have served, and will hang them not upon a green gallows, but upon a dry one so that all their life they shall neither prosper nor accumulate anything. And indeed, if there were a well-ordered government in the land, such wantonness might soon be checked and prevented, as was the custom in ancient times among the Romans, where such characters were promptly seized by the pate in a way that others took warning. No more shall all the rest prosper who change the open free market into a carrion pit of extortion and a den of robbery where the poor are daily overcharged, new burdens and high prices are imposed, and every one uses the market according to his caprice, and is even defiant and brags, as though it were his fair privilege and right to sell his goods for as high a price as he please, and no one had a right to say a word against it. We will indeed look on and let these people skin, pinch, and hoard, but we will trust in God, who will, however, do this of his own accord, that after you have been skinning and scraping for a long time, he will pronounce such a blessing on your gains, that your grain in the garner, your beer in the cellar, your cattle in the stalls shall perish. Yea, where you have cheated and overcharged any one to the amount of a florin, your entire pile shall be consumed with rust, so that you shall never enjoy it. And indeed, we see in experience this being fulfilled daily before our eyes, that no stolen or dishonestly acquired possession thrives. How many there are who rake and scrape day and night, and yet grow not a farthing richer! And, though they gather much, they must suffer so many plagues and misfortunes that they cannot relish it with cheerfulness, nor transmit it to their children. But as no one minds it, and we go on as though it did not concern us, God must visit us in a different way, and teach us manners by imposing one taxation after another, or billeting a troop of soldiers upon us, who in one hour empty our coffers and purses, and do not quit as long as we have a farthing left, and in addition, by way of thanks, burn and devastate house and home, and outrage and kill wife and children. And, in short, if you steal much, depend upon it, that again as much will be stolen from you, 
and he who robs and acquires with violence and wrong will submit to one who shall deal after the same fashion with him. For God is master of this art, that since every one robs and steals from the other, he punishes one thief by means of another. Else where should we find enough gallows and ropes? Now, whoever is willing to be instructed, let him know that this is the commandment of God, and that it must not be treated as a jest. For although you despise us, defraud, steal, and rob, we will indeed manage to endure your haughtiness, suffer, and according to the Lord's prayer forgive and show pity. For we know that the godly shall nevertheless have enough, and you injure yourself more than another. But beware of this. When the poor man comes to you, of whom there are so many now, who must buy with the penny of his daily wages and live upon it, and you are harsh to him, as though every one lived by your favor, and you skin and scrape to the bone, and, besides, with pride and haughtiness, turn him off, to whom you ought to give for nothing. He will go away wretched and sorrowful, and, since he can complain to no one, he will cry and call to heaven. Then beware, I say again, as of the devil himself, for such groaning and calling will be no jest, but will have a weight that will prove too heavy for you and all the world. For it will reach him who takes care of the poor sorrowful hearts, and will not allow them to go unavenged. But if you despise this and become defiant, see whom you have brought upon you. If you succeed and prosper, you may before all the world call God and me a liar. We have exhorted, warned, and protested enough. He who will not heed or believe it may go on until he learns this by experience. Yet it must be impressed upon the young, that they may be careful not to follow the old lawless crowd, but keep their eyes fixed upon God's commandment, lest his wrath and punishment come upon them too. It behooves us to do no more than to instruct and reprove with God's word, but to check such open wantonness there is need of the princes and government, who themselves would have eyes, and the courage to establish and maintain order in all manner of trade and commerce, lest the poor be burdened and oppressed, nor they themselves be loaded with other men's sins. Let this suffice as an explanation of what stealing is, that it be not taken too narrowly, but made to extend as far as we have to do with our neighbors and briefly in a summary, as in the former commandments, it is herewith forbidden in the first place to do our neighbor any injury or wrong in whatever manner supposable by curtailing, forestalling, and withholding his possessions and property, or even to consent or allow such a thing, but to interpose and prevent it. And, on the other hand, it is commanded that we advance and improve his possessions, and in case he suffers want that we help communicate, and lend, both to friends and foes. Whoever now seeks and desires good works will find here more than enough, such as are heartily acceptable and pleasing to God, and in addition are favored and crowned with excellent blessings, that we are to be richly compensated for all that we do for our neighbor's good and from friendship. As King Solomon also teaches, Proverbs 19.17, he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. Here then you have a rich Lord, who is certainly sufficient for you, and who will not suffer you to come short in anything or to want. Thus you can with a joyful conscience enjoy a hundred times more than you could scrape together with unfaithfulness and wrong. Now, whoever does not desire the blessing, will find wrath and misfortune enough. End of the Seventh Commandment